Korea, a nation divided, North and South locked in over half a century of conflict, a political focal point for the rest of the world. But this winter, all eyes were on the peninsula for a different reason, as Pyeongchang, South Korea, played host to the 2018 Paralympic Winter Games. It's been 30 years since the first Paralympic Games were held in Seoul, and although Korean unification may still be a dream, dozens of nations from around the globe have descended on the South, unified by their passion for this masterpiece of sport. This is Passion Connected. Pyeongchang 2018. It is said the Olympics show the capability of the human body. The Paralympics show the spirit. I, Anthony McLaughlin, am going to take you on a journey that will change the way you perceive disability. All the while bringing you a Paralympic experience you will not soon forget. These Canadian athletes have sacrificed so much to get to where they are today. Their shared life experience and obstacles have forged bonds that transcend borders. But don't be fooled. The level of competition you're going to witness is elite. From the intense speed exhibited on the alpine course carved into the side of a sacred mountain, to the determination displayed on the rolling landscape of the Nordic course, to the unbridled aggression on the ice at the Gangyang Hockey Centre, these games have all the intensity you love about sport. Along the way, you'll meet a handful of Canadian athletes, all with very different stories as we uncover the meaning and value of these games. Skier Mac Marcou and hockey player Tyrone Henry, two young athletes at different points in their Paralympic careers, will provide a glimpse of what a Paralympic journey looks like, from the inconceivable highs to the seemingly everlasting lows. Through Brian McKeever, a seasoned and successful cross-country skier, we'll analyze the Paralympic movement within Canada to understand where it's been but most importantly, where it's going. And with the help of South Korea's own Su Yoon Hong and her organization Tourism for All Korea, we'll look at accessibility within the land of the morning calm. It's been four years since the last Paralympic Games in Sochi. Over the course of that time, Ottawa native Tyrone Henry has earned a spot on Canada's national para ice hockey squad. But for the Paralympics, the roster needs to be whittled down to 17. With final cuts just around the corner, Port Colborne, Ontario was the location for their last training camp. After their skate, I caught up with the 24-year-old Paralympic hopeful. I am a little nervous, still a little hurdle to do, and the next few days it's still a challenge to make this team, and there's a lot of good, good players on this 20-man on this roster, and everybody's fighting for a spot, everybody's fighting for playing time, so... Having that competition just really makes us a lot better and I welcome the challenge. Having to trim the roster by three players made for a tense situation. Despite that, Tyrone feels spirits are high for the boys. We're all competitive, but we also are, are working together for, for a common goal. So we all want to get better and we all want to help each other get better. And I think that's, that's a really good atmosphere right now. And we, we all want to win that gold medal at the end of the day. So helping everybody get better is going to help us achieve that. And it, positive environment to be in right now, so it's been a good experience. With the last camp behind him, all that was left to do was to wait for the team to be named at CBC headquarters in downtown Toronto. It was only hours before the public announcement itself when Tyrone learned he was one step closer to his ultimate goal. At the ceremony, newly appointed captain Greg Westlake stated the squad's intentions. Uh, we're, we're going over to Pyeongchang to win a gold medal. That's our goal. We believe we can do it. We've done everything right to prepare. I believe in the power of the Paralympics, these amazing athletes right here. We're going over there to play gritty, play tough, bring home a gold medal, and put on a show for everybody. We can't wait to get over there and win for you. Thank you. Following Greg's message, an ecstatic Tyrone shared his excitement around making the team. It's awesome. Like it's such a humbling experience. Like we've been working so hard the last three three years I've been on the team, and but the whole team's been working so hard for four years just to get to this moment. And now we're so close, and uh, we just want to get over there and, and get to work. So it's been quite a ride, and uh, there's a little bit left to do. So we're excited for that. 
Ty labels himself as a stay-at-home defenseman. And while gold is on everyone's minds, he just wants to contribute. I want to be one of the guys on the ice, really grinding it out and helping the other guys succeed. I want to fill my role and, and make sure that they have the freedom to do what they need to do to get points on the board just so we can, we can win games and eventually get a gold medal. One of the players Ty style benefits is fellow defenseman Adam Dixon. Head coach Ken Babby's strategy is to partner offensively gifted defenders with players who are a little more focused on their own end. And that's where Ty comes in. With Tyrone being steady back there and being trustworthy, um, it allows Adam to go uh, on more of the offense, make some uh, plays in the offensive zone, get down deep, and uh, really cause some confusion uh, in terms of uh, their defensive zone coverage. And, you know, we can do that because we know Tyrone's back and he's a key part of it all. While it came down to the wire for Tyrone to be named to Team Canada, Mac Marcoux of Sault Ste. Marie had a less suspenseful lead up to the games. Having captured a gold and two bronze medals in Sochi in the visually impaired classification, he was a shoe in to make the para alpine team. There's been definitely a little more pressure coming into these games than Sochi, but uh, I think just mentally kind of tricking yourself that it's just another day on the mountain is a big one because if you, you know start thinking about where you are and yeah, it's, it is the Paralympics, but at the end of the day, it is just another race. So it's just trying to get that into your head so that you're not thinking so much, I think is the big thing. Jack Leach is Max's guide on the hill and leads him down the mountain using a headset to impart important details about the course as they reach speeds over 100 kilometers an hour. Over the past two years of skiing together, the duo formed a bond that transcends the sport they love. If anyone can speak to the pressure Mac may feel coming into these games and what his expectations are, it's Jack. For him, I am making sure that uh, he, um, I want to say proves himself isn't the right term, but um, just reinforces that, you know, he is kind of a top dog out there and bring home some hardware will be a big thing for him. For Jack, Mac's mental discipline is a big part of what makes him so successful. I think it's awesome. Honestly, I, I share a lot of the same mentality. Like the fact that um, you know we've been very successful, so I think we come in with the mindset that you know if we ski well, do everything we need to in order to perform our best, that the results will they'll be there. So yeah, just not focusing on that, more on the task at hand, and um, but at the same time, you know, goal is definitely in his mind. A two-person sport where one guides the other not only requires a lot of trust but it also creates a unique dynamic, one Mac and Jack have a lot of fun with. It is very different compared to the team sport of para ice hockey. For Tyrone, his love of the game came before he was even eligible to be a para ice hockey player. It was at a time when the sport was still called sledge hockey and Ty still had the use of his legs. I was just flipping through the channels one day. Uh, I saw something call, called sledge hockey on on the on the on the channel list, and I said, "Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna check that out." It says hockey, so I just want to see what's what's going on here. And then right away, I was like, "Hey, I want to kind of be a part of this, and I want to see what this is all about." Hockey has always been a passion of Tyrone's, but no one could have anticipated how important it would become in a few short months. We were just driving home one day. It was late late September night. We were. Drive like about 100 meters from the house. Uh, we ended up flipping the vehicle, and I uh, wasn't able to get out of the vehicle. And right away, so I, I knew something was wrong. Tyrone's father, Andrew Henry, recalls the experience upon reaching the hospital. My daughter was in one hospital. My two youngest were in the children's hospital, getting checked over. Tyrone was also in the children's hospital, and uh, he was doing the scans and all. And I was asked to come over to the children's hospital because things look pretty rough. When I got there, I learned that things were pretty dire. In the emergency room, he was told that his spine had been badly fractured, basically pulverized one of his vertebrae, a T12, and uh, there was no room for his spinal cord. Following the life-changing prognosis of paraplegia, Andrew was astonished by his son's instant focus on a new goal. Tyron has been now settled into the ICU and the uh, room's dark. He's staring at the ceiling. We're just waiting for time to pass until the surgeon can come in. Uh, 
All of a sudden, this voice pops up. Tyrone says, uh, I knew I was never going to play for the men's Olympic hockey team, so I'll just play for the men's uh, sledge hockey team instead. I know that Tyrone uh, decided from that moment that he was going to uh, get, in the, get in the game rather than sit on the sidelines. My thought went instantly to the Vancouver Paralympics, and I, I knew right then that that's what I wanted to do, and so that's been kind of what we've been uh, driving forward towards uh, for the last eight years, and having that in the back of my mind, like when I was in the hospital there saying, I'm gonna be a part of that sledge hockey team, I'm gonna be a part of that para-ice hockey team, I'm gonna be a part of that, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna make that team, and I'm gonna go to the Paralympics, and I'm gonna win a gold medal for Canada. Tyrone saw through his new obstacle to an opportunity, an opportunity based on curiosity and the flick of a channel one winter prior. Tyrone's mom, Mary Ann Jans, recognizes the impact the sport has had on her son's life. He doesn't ever look down. He's always looking forward to what he can do. And I think the fact that he could do sledge hockey was something that gave him hope. And that was his dream to now become a Canadian hockey player. I just love him so much. I couldn't be prouder. Tyrone's sister, Samantha, has been by her brother's side throughout the hardships and has witnessed his resilience firsthand. He hates when you say that he's inspirational, but he really is. He's, he's um, obviously, he, he works so hard to, to be where he's at now, and he's, um, he's accomplishing so much, and he's going to keep accomplishing. I'm sure he's going to have a lot of really good years of hockey ahead of him, but just to, to keep going, keep pushing, and it's amazing to come for somebody, anybody, when they have that kind of a life-changing event, immediately it's just, well, what am I gonna do with this? And he like, he's, yeah, he's pretty cool. Mac Marcou has a lot in common with Tyrone Henry. Their lifelong passion for sport helped shape who the young men are today. And a traumatic event set them both down an unexpected path. For Tyrone, it was an unfortunate car accident. For Mac, it was vision loss. Diagnosed with a juvenile form of macular degeneration called Stargardt disease, Mac began his journey to the Paralympics before he was 10 years old. He was able to find a passion so quickly because sport, and more importantly speed, had been a big part of his life from an early age. Mac's dad, Bill, recalls his son's hunger for it. Right from the start, because we did four-wheeling and snowmobiling and uh, I race snow machines, and, uh, you know, when you take him for a ride, he'd always be yelling faster, faster, faster. Uh, so speed wasn't an issue for him. And he liked the, the uh, mountain biking and uh, all the trick riding. And, you know, he liked adrenaline. Max family has a long-standing tradition for speed. But when he began losing his vision, he had to find other ways to fuel his passion. When I started to lose my vision, um, I wasn't really able to race go-karts anymore safely. Um, so we uh, started looking into sports as a family just for vision impaired athletes and something we could all do together and um, kind of stumbled across ski racing. Mac's mom, Lee, wouldn't use the word stumbled. She recalled a persuasive phone call from Alpine Canada, encouraging her to let Mac get into racing. I said, you do know my son's visually impaired and they're like, yeah, and I said, and you know, Maybe it's a bit dangerous, and he goes, well, is that really your decision to make, or do you think that might be Max? And I was like, who am I talking to? <laughs> I was eight years old, I joined the local club in Sault Ste. Marie, and it sort of just kind of snowballed from there. I fell in love with the sport right away, and uh, I raced able-bodied for four years until my vision got bad enough that I started needing a guide. Keeping it in the family, Max's brother BJ stepped up to help his little brother. We got a couple headsets and started practicing at our own hill and we decided to go to a Canadian Nationals and give it a try and, and we ended up having some good success there. Not many people get the chance to say they get to travel the world and uh, ski on a competitive circuit with their brother. It's pretty sweet to be able to have that kind of bond with your brother. It wasn't long before they caught Alpine Canada's attention and were eventually named to the national team in 2014 just in time for the Sochi Winter Games. But before they could make it there, BJ was forced to withdraw from competition because of a nagging back injury. 
with a new guide, Mac was forced to reassess his expectations. You know, we prepared for so long leading up to the games together and uh, just having him go out, you know, a week and a bit before uh, definitely <laughs> threw my head into spin quite a bit and uh, in a way it kind of relieved pressure <laughs> because we came in with like pretty set goals and I mean, I think that was uh, kind of a blessing, you know, it's, I didn't do too much overthinking and it made for a pretty enjoyable experience. Unable to participate in Sochi together was difficult, but BJ still gets to be a part of his brother's journey, now cheering him on from the grandstands. <laughs> Stepping into BJ's place was Jack Leach. Mac recalls the confidence he had in Jack from their very first time on the mountain. It was honestly a lot more seamless than I thought it would be. We met in Whistler and um, just kind of hung out off snow and then we uh, went down to South America and started skiing together and it went better than I thought it could have gone times 100. Four days in, we were skiing wide open together. Right away, you could see how strong Jack was on skis and I think that just made it a lot easier for me to trust him. You know, if I could see that he's super confident, it makes me be able to be confident behind him and know that he's not going to lead me astray. Over the last two years, Mac and Jack have dominated the international stage. Being Mac's right-hand man, Jack feels their success comes from more than just being great skiers. Honestly, I think a lot of it is uh, the friendship that we built together. First camps together two years ago in Chile. We were just kind of getting to know each other, building that on-snow trust. And I think that just grew as our friendship grew. You know, I'm a year older than him. Um, we share a lot of the same interests and everything, so we get along great. And just that chemistry on and off the hill, I think, is great for our trust levels. And I guess he has no problem trusting me down the hill, so yeah, it tends to work out pretty well. Despite their poise on the hill, Jack still marvels at Mac's abilities as an individual with low vision. You know, for me going down a course, like, it can be scary enough at times. You know, I think we hit speeds close to 120 at times. So yeah, the fact that he has no central vision and he has 6% of his peripherals, he says. So yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy, it's impressive. Any other family might not be so keen on seeing their loved one cruising down a mountain at those speeds, especially since wipeouts in Alpine can be catastrophic. Bill Marcou admits it can get to him sometimes, but Mac has always had a hunger for thrill. I'm pretty much on the redneck side as far as speed goes. Uh, that part don't bother me. My wife gets a little stressed out, but I prefer the speed. It does get to me when it's, uh, when it's go time. The hills are wild. Nerves aside, the Marku family are excited to be sharing this Paralympic experience with Mac. With him being so busy and constantly traveling, Mac's mom, Lee, enjoys every day she gets to be around her boy. You know what? He is never down in the dumps. He's never miserable. He lives his day very positively. And, um, you know, for someone that might have something to complain about, he never complains. So he makes all of us so much better people. Just, he's a pleasure to be around. Not just because he's my son. He's just a, he's just a great guy. Sport. For many, it's an outlet. A way to feel better, to challenge yourself, to play with and compete against others. For para-athletes, it goes beyond that. Their drive to be active can be a staple in their recovery. For a select few, their passion and dedication has taken them far beyond what they could have expected or hoped for. But they couldn't have done it alone. The Canadian Paralympic Committee, or CPC, plays a key role in the development of all elite para-athletes in this country. Todd Nicholson is a five-time Paralympian in para ice hockey, and for these games, the chef de mission. As the official spokesperson and unofficial head cheerleader of the Canadian Paralympic team, Todd is a mentor, a leader, and an inspiration to all of the athletes. His experience and passion in and for the Paralympic movement makes him the perfect person to explain why sport is so important. Physical activity is something that we really need to stress upon our youth and team sport or individual sport. They all have certain aspects of them 
that really help build each individual as a Canadian um, to be able to share that knowledge, to share that experience. And as we work towards success, um, you know, hopefully everybody will find the right group of people to surround themselves with for them to be successful. CEO of the CPC, Karen O'Neill certainly agrees with Todd and sees sport as having a global impact for good. In today's world, with so many different ways that we divide the world, divide our perspectives and lose context, I really see sport as an incredible unifier. And then when you overlay that with the Paralympics, particularly when you've got athletes first and foremost, and individuals that are athletes with a disability, who bring resilience and uh, an approach towards their athletic pr prowess. I can't think of a, a better representation to elevate our view of the world, to bring together the community, whether it be our communities in our country in Canada or Canada on the world stage internationally. Beyond sports impact, the CPC is working diligently to ensure there is a foundation with resources for youth athletes that will build consistency for years to come. The mission is to develop and support a sustainable sports system that helps move and support our athletes to the podium. And one of the reasons I emphasize that is because it's one thing to be here at games and looking at uh, peak performance and results, but unless we have something underneath that, unless we have a sustainable sports system, then those results will be fleeting and we're looking at consistent and repeatable results. Part of that system are programs that foster growth within Canadian para sport. Programs both Tyrone and Mac came up through. One such initiative is the Paralympian Search. So we create an opportunity for one day. We bring the whole team together to uh, provide an environment that this individual has a lot of attention, uh, opportunities to be able to kind of test themselves and a little bit of education and support for both them and their parents. So they've got some options and I'm gonna say some navigation pathways after that day for what the next steps would be whether it be a pathway to be a Paralympic team member, or they say, you know what, from what I've seen today, in fact, it might be a pathway, but I'd like to be involved recreationally in a particular sport. You know, it's about opening the doors and it's about creating an environment that's safe, welcoming and inclusive. Even with all the efforts being put forth by the CPC, it's often the athletes and their success that are the best recruitment tool for the next generation. And I can honestly say, when you speak to some of our athletes here, they point to who they saw on TV or who they saw on a magazine to say, this is possible. One athlete who is often pointed at as a source for inspiration is Brian McKeever. Brian's accomplishments as a cross-country skier have motivated many young people to pick up a pair of sport and get active, including Mac Marcou. Brian McKeever was a huge influence for me. You know, he raced with his brother. He has the same disease I do. And he was kind of someone that my mom would talk to when I was a little kid and just kind of like ask, you know, generic questions like, how do you get into sport or like little things. And he was always given pointers. Getting to race with someone who's as successful as he is. Um, yeah, we're in different sports, but we're here together with Canada. And I think just kind of being in the same venue is is pretty awesome, there's a lot of good energy. Brian and Mac are the only visually impaired athletes representing Canada in Pyeongchang, which has created a natural bond between the duo. But despite inspiring Mac to get on skis, Brian sees some major differences. And you see it in his racing, that I mean, he goes for it. Ripping fast, and you need that in a sport like that. I mean, I don't, I, I don't, I don't have the stones to, to do what he does. Uh, I'm, I'm scared. I wish I wasn't, and so that's why I find that inspiring. Like these guys that are willing to go for it. It's a different personality, different mentality, and it takes all types. Pyeongchang is Brian's fifth games, and over the decades, he's established himself as one of the most dominant Paralympians in Canada and around the world. While the competitive fire still burns strong inside of him, being in the twilight of his career has given him a new perspective. I'm the old man on the team now. Been, I'm the guy that's been to the most games and all that stuff. So it's a lot of experience there, but also it's the knowledge that it can go away very quickly. The mind is willing, the body isn't, and, and that's okay too. Like for the first time in my career, I'm okay with a lot of these things, like the knowledge that it's coming to an end. And that's part of transitioning, growing in the sport as well. And, and so what makes this special is, first of all, I, I was able to get here in 
reasonable health. I know that it's probably my last chance to have a good competitive game. Even though his Paralympic journey may be nearing its end, Brian's passion for cross country is deeply rooted in his life. Following in the ski tracks of his older brother Robin, his love affair with the sport started at a young age. Having an older brother who was went through exactly the same stuff, you know, starting skiing at, at the same age, two or three, and racing around the same and, and moving on through it. And having him six years older was always an easy carrot for me to follow. So that was super important to have Robin there. And the fact that he was having really good success made it easy for me to see that was possible as well. At 18, Brian was diagnosed with Stargardt's disease, which left him unsure of his future in cross country. But Robin, an Olympian in his own right, stepped up to help his brother chase his new dream, first as his guide, and now as the head coach of the Canadian Para Nordic team. You know, you got the opportunity to take on this para world in skiing when the eyesight went uh, legally blind, I guess, as far as what we consider legally blind for our sport, and it's just been game on from there, because he was already a phenomenal skier on the junior national team at 18 years old, and then the eyesight crashed. So it was an easy transition, let's call it, and he's also been, you know, kind of almost a hero of mine. With Robin's support, Brian has had tremendous success as a cross-country skier, and if all goes as planned in Pyeongchang, he will become the most decorated winter Paralympian in Canadian history. The 20K, the 10K, we know that if we're in shape, we can win those races if we have a good day. The sprint is a bit of an unknown commodity because depending on, they, these young guys are, they've got snap, they've got speed, they're hard to beat. Uh, if we have a very good day, it's possible, but that's gonna be the hard one. So the goals haven't changed in that respect, that we're here, we're gonna try and win three. With Brian's career nearing its end, it's time for the people he inspired, like Mac, to take the torch and hold it high. And while following in the footsteps of your heroes is a great way to spark interest, Todd feels there can be obstacles that keep children from reaching their athletic potential. In some situations, when you have a child with a disability, if they've been born with their disability, <clears throat> the child is super excited and wants to get involved. But some of the biggest challenges is trying to encourage those parents to allow their kids to be active, to fall down, to get back up. Um, I've fallen a lot, um, whether it's playing in sports, um, didn't quite hit a curb right and fallen out of my chair, but you gotta get back up and get right back into it again. You can't let stuff like that slow you down. Picking themselves up is something all Paralympians have done. Michelle Salt is a prime example of this resilience. The 33-year-old Canadian para-snowboarder's Paralympic story began in 2011 after a near-fatal motorcycle accident. Was going up a hill, 120 kilometers an hour, highway speeds, lost control, hit a guardrail, did cartwheels in the air, hit the guardrail again. Upon impact, I broke almost every bone in both my legs. I broke my pelvis, my hips, my L4, L5 vertebrae, right clavicle, punctured lung, and bruised my spleen. And when I broke my right femur in two places, it severed my femoral artery, so I was bleeding out. Spent seven days on life support, five months in the hospital, and I lost 75% of my right leg. Just prior to the accident, the Calgary native had been training for a fitness competition. She believes her peak physical condition played a key role in her survival. It was literally what saved my life um, because my heart was strong when I was losing that blood. I also think that without my the level of muscle that I had, I would have broke my back and potentially been paralyzed. So, you know, health is important. She's also very passionate about her sport and feels an obligation to get more young women with disabilities involved. If a girl that, you know, went from holding someone's hands, not being able to get down the hill, not being able to bend her prosthetic leg can go to, you know, the courses that we're riding now, a massive drop at the end where you feel like you're falling out of a building. I think that anybody can do it. I think that it's possible. Girls just need to come out, give it a try, start with bank slalom, you know, progress to border cross and just find the passion that us girls have found. With people like Michelle and Brian inspiring future generations, coupled with the immeasurable efforts of Karen, Todd, and the rest of the CPC, there is no doubt Canada's Paralympic future is golden.
The opening ceremonies, a cherished tradition of the Winter Games. Years of blood, sweat and tears brought athletes to this moment. Host nations show off their culture through traditional dance, music and song. Involving hundreds of performers, the elaborate show pays tribute to the spirit of the Games. For a select few, this is an even more special moment, as they hold the privilege and honor to lead their nation into Paralympic Stadium as flag bearer. Representing Canada at the opening ceremonies this year is none other than 10-time Paralympic gold medalist Brian McKeever. He reflected on his latest distinction prior to the big event. These opportunities are very rare and to have the honour of leading Team Canada into the opening ceremonies is really special. So I'm looking forward to it. I'm excited. I'm a little nervous. Uh, maybe more so for that, for that than actually racing. <laughs> a grand fireworks display wrapped up the show. And with that, the athletes had one last night of rest before competition. Day one saw Mac Marcou take to the Para Alpine Center for the first of five disciplines he would compete in within the visually impaired category. Men's downhill, regarded by some as the most prestigious of all five disciplines. The downhill combines the highest speeds, up to 120 kilometers an hour. The greatest vertical drop, 825 meters. Crashes are frequent and bludgeoning. On day one, racers put it all on the line. Designed to test a skier's skill at high speeds, there are fewer gates in downhill compared to the other para-alpine disciplines. With 10 skiers in the field and slated to race third, Mac and Jack awaited their turn with anticipation. Until finally, their moment arrived. Bursting out of the gate, Mac and Jack got the start they were hoping for. The duo attacked the mountain, maintaining their solid run through the top. Pushing for the finish line, they gave it their all, and it paid off, leapfrogging USA and Spain for first place. Despite some tense moments watching the remaining seven, Mac secured Canada's very first medal of the 2018 Paralympic Games. After, Mac and Jack spoke to their gold medal success. It's pretty surreal right now. It's kind of overwhelming. I'm feeling pretty numb, um, but yeah, I think uh, I can't say enough, we're so excited and kind of have the weight lifted off our shoulders on the first race. Now we can ski the rest of the week and just have fun, you know? We haven't lost a downhill race yet together. So, you know, this one is uh, probably the most special so far, I'd say. And yeah, for me, first uh, Paralympic Games and medal in the first event is pretty special. Mac had a chance to catch up with his family briefly across a fence in the media zone. It's just so awesome having them here. Uh, it's pretty rare they get to come out and watch me ski, especially, you know, most of our races are overseas, so having them here right close supporting us is uh, it's a pretty special feeling. After Mac's heroics on the hill, the Gangyong Hockey Centre was the venue for Canada's first preliminary matchup. Their opponent, Sweden. Led by their captain, Greg Westlake, Canada entered the tournament with unfinished business after a bronze medal finish in Sochi. In their first game, they made a statement, dismantling the Swedes 17-0. Several players on Team Canada had multiple points, and Tyrone Henry wouldn't be held off the score sheet, as he and Rob Armstrong assisted on Liam Hickey's first of the tournament. After the game, Tyrone described his emotions leading up to his first Paralympic experience. I had to take a moment in the dressing room before the game. That was it was kind of surreal. Yeah. Dreaming about it for so long, uh, being able to finally do it. Um, it was it was a really good feeling. Tyrone hasn't been alone on his journey, and sharing his debut with the people who supported him most, his family, made it even more special. I noticed them in the warm-ups, and I was, I was kind of happy to see them, and um, they were all excited and cheering the whole time. And um, after the game, I gave a little wave, and and uh, they're all they're all yelling and screaming. So. They were pretty loud out there and um, definitely heard them and uh, I'm really happy they, they made it out here. Collecting his first point as a Paralympic athlete, Ty spoke to his role on the team. It's not a huge part of my game, but all, when you ever get on the scoreboard, it's always good and I always want to help my teammates be better. So it always feels good to help my teammates succeed and it was a good game. So a lot of guys got, got points and just uh, going forward, we can, we can kind of focus on the positives from this. 
back on the mountain for day two of the games, Mac and Jack were ready to build on their day one success. Day two's discipline, the Super G. Combining the speed of downhill and the technical skills required for slalom, the Super G is made up of long winding turns and vertical drops similar to downhill. Confident and fresh off the podium, Mac and Jack launched out of the gate. Halfway down the course, Mac lost control. Afterwards, Mac broke down what happened. We were skiing really well out of the start, and uh, the top section was was awesome. You know, we were packing heat. I was having a really good run. I was I was really excited with the way we were skiing, and ended up just getting caught up in, uh, in one of the important parts of the course. And and uh, yeah, gravity took over, and I ended up falling over. But uh, yeah, I think we're really excited with how things are going, and it's a lot of good momentum moving forward into the Super Combine. Still riding the high of gold, the stumble wasn't going to dampen their spirits, but they still needed a bounce back performance. Unfortunately, the struggles continued in the Super G run of Super Combined. Mac lost an edge and once again hit the snow. We were really skiing well. It was just kind of two little technical errors in a row that just really unlucky, but at the same time, you know, I was just a little inside and it, it happens, you know, we got thrown off and it definitely, uh, hey, we would have liked for Super G's to go a little better, but it's, uh, yeah, it's all behind us now. Mac and Jack's games have seen their ups and downs. Another individual who has faced obstacles in her everyday life is Suyun Hong of Seoul, the capital and largest city in South Korea. With over 25 million living in the metropolitan area, the city has a lot to offer its residents who have obstacles in their lives. Several accessibility initiatives accommodate those with visual impairments and mobility-related issues. Like all countries, however, there are things that need improving. While hosting the Paralympics can help push accessibility along, individuals also need to step up and fight for what's right. Suyun is the founder of a nonprofit called Tourism for All Korea and is incredibly passionate about traveling and accessibility. Being a power wheelchair user since she was 10 years old, she has seen accessibility within Korea grow from almost nothing to what it is today. Suyun's passion for travel began in her early 20s when the construction of the KTX train allowed her to visit the metropolis of Seoul more easily. This motivated her to take bigger trips and eventually travel the world. I really love traveling. So I went to Europe, um, 25 cities and I think seven countries by myself. It was really good. I can experience another culture, especially culture for the disabilities. It is really different between Korea and other countries. And I um, understand that why this kind of um, different environments are occur in other countries and then how can they start this kind of development and how can they develop their um, accessible tourism policies environment and how can they do this kind of things then why in Korea people cannot do this kind of things inspired Suyun started her company originally called Accessible Korea, she not only began consulting local and international disabled travelers, but also began researching and campaigning for better accessibility policies at home. I work like two and a half years now, and I changed it as a side a little bit, and people really love it. And people now in Korea, especially disabilities, are trying to go out from their house, and they want to do traveling and they want to go somewhere, and they want to do some activities. Sharing her passion for travel and campaigning for improved access, which has seen direct implementation, has opened the door for others to explore not only South Korea, but beyond. And Suyun has received a lot of positive feedback. Um, I got several emails and texts from them, and it's really, really, you know, like, how can I say that? You know, feedback is really you know touching in my heart. So uh, because of that, I think I cannot stop this work. Yeah, and I'm still doing this work, and I will gonna do some more work about accessible tourism. But you know, still I cannot really change the world or change the Korea fast as I I feel or fast as I think. But I can do slowly, and society will gonna change slowly. So I think, yeah, I can stop this. <laughs>
Her work improving accessibility has come a long way. Just last year, she successfully lobbied to have all elevator entrances to the Seoul subway system clearly labeled on maps given to tourists. Despite her efforts, there are still challenges, especially outside the major cities. But the greatest challenge to overcome is attitudes. I think the most big problem is to change people's mind. We have many accessibility facilities, especially we have, you know, like, you know, bathroom or we have uh, the textile and we have service cars and we have train service, airplane service. We almost have any, everything. But still, people think that, um, how can I say that, people with disabilities are secondary citizens, not really equal. Changing perceptions is one of the byproducts of the Paralympic movement. But the games can also have a tangible impact on the lives of people with disabilities. There is often a legacy of accessibility that is left in host nations long after the closing ceremonies. But it all starts with accommodating the athletes. In Pyeongchang and at the venues, accessibility is a top priority, which is something manual wheelchair user Tyrone Henry is grateful for. Accessibility has been, been fantastic and uh, I can't, I can't I have no complaints about it. It's been, it's been great. Just having all the volunteers out there doing, doing a lot of hard work, making sure that the paths are clear uh, and salted for us to be able to push up and down uh, to, the, to the dinner, to the transportation. I mean, they, they've been doing a great job. While Su Yoon is hopeful the games will have a positive impact on her country's accessibility initiatives, she knows there will still be work to be done. But she hopes one day, her efforts will no longer be needed. Someday, I don't want to speak about accessibility. If I lose a job, because everyone know how to put accessibility stuff, then I think that's my final goal. <laughs> In the meantime, Su Yoon will keep fighting to improve the lives of people with disabilities. Back at the Gangyong Hockey Centre, Team Canada picked up right where they left off in Game 2 of the preliminary round. Their next victim? Italy. The boys jumped out to an early lead with three first period goals and never looked back, eventually winning 10-0, remaining unbeaten. Tyrone Henry was a plus four on the night, logging 16 minutes of ice time. Team Canada's last preliminary matchup drew the Norwegians, and once again, they were firing on all cylinders. Winning 8-0, Canada outscored their opponents 35-0 through the prelims. Any hockey player will tell you those aren't necessarily the most fun games to be a part of. That's where head coach Ken Babby's job comes in, to ensure his team maintains focus. You know, we want to be a high-paced team and we don't want to uh, sit back because we're looking ahead to uh, playing a high-paced game in a semi-final and uh, if we get through that, uh, into the medal game. So it's important to keep our style going all the time. Unfortunately, Tyrone Henry wasn't dressed for this game. IPC rules stipulate at the Paralympics, teams can only dress 15 of their 17 players, meaning two of the world's best are forced to watch from the stands. Ken reinforced Tyrone's value to the team, but didn't tip his hand as to whether he'd rotate back into the lineup. It's just a matter of uh, trying to get some guys in the roster, and he played two games, and uh, we just thought, you know, uh, it might be good for him to have a rest. He's logged some some uh, good time for us, so you know we'll, we'll look at him for uh, the semifinals and everybody else on the roster. Back at the Alpine Center, Mac Marcoux had just two more disciplines to compete in. If there was a time to get back on track, giant slalom would have to be it. One of the more technical disciplines, giant slalom typically has at least 30 gates. With two heats, the skier with the fastest time wins. Conservatively navigating the mountain, Mac landed in fourth place at the end of his first run. If he wanted to reach the podium, he would need to put the previous two crashes out of his mind and nail his final run. With family and friends watching in anticipation, Mac and Jack reminded their peers why they are favorites every time they hit the snow. Cutting 1.37 seconds off his time, Mac vaulted into third place, capturing the bronze medal. Shortly after, an elated Mac breathed a sigh of relief. We were super excited to, to come out of today with the bronze. Uh, we were uh, riding the struggle bus a little bit for the last couple of days with, uh, you know, we were skiing really well, just couldn't put a run together. And 
Thank God Jack kind of talked me up between runs and got me uh, thinking positive instead of dwelling on little mistakes. So it was good to be able to come down, put a, a conservative but finish this morning and then uh, step it up a little bit and uh, move up one position land on the bottom of the podium. Mack would eventually finish fourth in the final discipline of slalom. But after collecting gold and bronze to wrap up his games, he had a lot to celebrate. Mack's girlfriend, Chelsea Gadette, was relieved that it was all over and even more proud of his accomplishments. I've been nervous probably this whole time, just like holding my breath the whole time he's coming down the hill. We've been together for about two and a half years. I wasn't around for Sochi, so this is my first Paralympics with him. Just seeing how hard he's worked over the last two and a half years, he's deserved this more than anything. Having your family along for the ride is an added bonus. Another Paralympian who enjoys that advantage is visually impaired cross-country skier Brian McKeever. With his brother, Coach Robin, by his side, he had an enormously successful games. He collected three gold medals, one in the 10K, the 20K, the 1.5 kilometer classic sprint, and for good measure, a bronze medal in open relay. It's confirmation that we're still competitive and that we're still doing the right things. Uh, you know, we put in a lot of work over four years here and we put in a lot of good work, especially this year. We, we live in a very good place in Canmore to do the training. So, uh, you know, we, we take a lot of comfort in that and we take, we take a lot of confidence in, in what we do. And, and I think when we come here, we, we have that in us and we take that into the races and I think it shows. In total, Brian's Paralympic medal count sits at 17, 13 of which are gold. His dominance in Pyeongchang makes him Canada's most decorated winter Paralympian. It's been a long ride for Brian, and he's not sure if he'll be back in four years' time. One thing is certain, however, his legacy will inspire young para-athletes for years to come. Back on the ice, Canada and Korea were set to face off in the semifinals. While Canada was the heavy favorite, it was Korea looking to inspire their nation. Advancing to a final four was a big deal for the para hockey program that started just eight years ago. Although Canada would go on to win 7-0, the Koreans in the stands cheered on their countrymen, and in return, the players took a bow. Tyrone once again found himself the victim of the numbers game and was not dressed. But always a team player, he found another way to contribute. It's just a few notes just for the team and just trying to keep my mind focused on the game and, and the process of how we, how we play and uh, just keeping my mind sharp on hockey uh, at, all, at all times. And that's just one of those things that, that helps with uh, if, if I'm called upon, I'm ready to go. Headed to the gold medal game as the odd man out isn't ideal for Ty, but team captain Greg Westlake put things in perspective. You know, in, in Paralympic sport, he's got a, he's got a difficult uh, impairment for sledge hockey. Uh, being, being a paraplegic, um, you know, there's so many double amp leg amputees, and that's such an advantage in the sport. You can whip around faster, you, you, you know, and uh, he's got a tough disability. So for him, it's it's even more work. So for him, just the accomplishment to make Team Canada be the only person with his disability on our team is a testament. He's probably the best player in the world with his disability. Um, I don't have any reservations saying that. Greg also had no reservations pointing out that even though Tyrone isn't playing right now, he is a key member of the team. It's kind of that bittersweet thing because when a guy's sitting that you really get along with, who's such a good teammate, uh, your heart goes out for him, but it also makes you want to play for him. And, uh, you, you know, I, I think Tyrone knows this, but, it, you know, if we're able to go out there and win a gold medal on Sunday, you know, he's a part of that. And, and he's pushed us at practice every day. He moved to the Toronto area from Ottawa uh, just to get on the ice with some better guys, you know, rented a house, made a big commitment to this team to, to train as hard as he can. And I got a lot of love and a lot of respect for that man. So if I can go out there and, and up my performance just a little a bit thinking about you know how badly he'd like to be out there I'll, I'll definitely do it and with that the stage was set for one of the greatest rivalries in sport Canada USA fighting for Paralympic gold Canada got off to a great start over halfway through the first period Billy Bridges received a cross ice pass and ripped one on goal American netminder Steve Cash got a piece of it with his glove but couldn't get enough as the puck ricocheted into the top corner the game remained 1-0 into the third period as Canada's goalie Dominic LaRocque and USA's Cash stood the test of time, turning aside opportunity after opportunity. With just over a minute left in the game, the US coach pulled the goalie for the extra attacker. 
getting the puck out of their zone, Canada's Rob Armstrong made his move up the boards. From a bad angle, pressure from the defense and shooting from his offhand, Armstrong rung it off the post. The U.S. worked it up the ice, eventually gaining the offensive zone. Then, the unbelievable. Behind them. Now it's Roybal, ghosting away from one. Roybal's got options square, it's come back, panic, Farmer! What is going on? Declan Farmer, 37 seconds left on the clock. USA's Declan Farmer picked up a deflected pass in the slot to the left of the rock and made no mistake sending it over the sprawling netminder. The game was headed to overtime. In the extra frame, Farmer's late game heroics were repeated. Weaving into the zone, Farmer made a move into the slot and faked a shot exposing the defense. Cutting across the net, he let a wrister go that found the top left corner. USA had completed the late comeback to become 2018 Paralympic champions. In full uniform, Tyrone joined his team on the ice to receive his silver medal. Post game, an emotional Greg Westlake had words for his teammates who came as close as you possibly can to bringing gold back to Canada. At some point when things settle down a little bit, I'll have the opportunity to say, hey guys, uh, firstly, there's gold medals in this room, even if you don't know it yet. And secondly, you have a silver medal, you're, you're the second best in the world at the sport you chose to pick up, and you get to go home and inspire other people to pick up sport and, and, and to pick up in life, no matter what hardships you go through. And I think that's a special thing. You know, we truly thought we were going to get it done tonight. It's a, it's a tough one right now in this moment, but, you know, I wouldn't trade the last three and a half years with those guys for anything. The team itself is going through a youth movement, with multiple young leaders on the team ready to step up. We got a lot of great young guys. Liam Hickey was all over the ice tonight, had a bunch of chances. Tyler McGregor, I played with him the last three years, a lot on my line. Um, he's a leader, he's an incredible person. Um, there's just so many guys, I feel bad picking a few, but they're, the team the, 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 is in good hands, everything's gonna be fine. You know, right now it seems like the walls are caving in, but uh, you know, everyone's gonna take a breath and come back and you know, next September's gonna come and uh, you know, it'll be, be a good day and the sun's gonna set in Canada and everything will be fine. Although Canada's para ice hockey team came up just shy of their ultimate goal, there was a lot of positives to take away from Pyeongchang. Canada's athletes delivered the nation's most successful Paralympic Games ever, accumulating 28 total medals, a significant improvement from 19 in 2010 and 16 in 2014. And Canada couldn't have been more proud, which was evident when the athletes touched down in Toronto and were greeted in the airport by a ruckus crowd. Showing off his gold medal, Mac Marcou reminisced on his success. The <laughs> highlight was, uh, was definitely the downhill, and I think uh, overall it was just the experience in general was unreal. It was so much fun to be there, and first time being in a village with all the athletes instead of having separate villages, so it was just uh, it was unique, and it was just really awesome to be there. Worn out and certainly jet lagged, Mac had one thing on his mind. Just taking some time for, for myself to, to, uh, to really just get back. I haven't spent much time at home in the last couple of years, so uh, they're gonna take the next couple months just to chill out. At his home in Canada, Tyrone Henry reflected on his first Paralympic experience. And although he wasn't able to play in the final game, he's proud of the guys who did. They've put a lot of hard work on the ice and they, they've played a really good game. I think they showcased their sport really well. We showed what para ice hockey is and what it can be in the future. And uh, I think that's, that's a key thing and everybody in Canada knows how good we are. And I think the whole world knows how good we are. Having time to digest the loss, Tyrone is ready to turn the page and begin the next step of his journey, but will carry the lessons he learned with him forever. Having gotten a silver, looking at that almost every morning, every day, realizing that we were so close. Having that in the back of your mind and never wanting to have that happen again, that'll drive me to, to do more than I did in the last few years. And Tyrone has not lost focus of his ultimate goal. I just want to bring a gold medal home to Canada. We have uh, a really good group of guys here, uh, and in the future we're going to do some really great things together, and uh, I'm looking forward to that. It is said the Olympics show the capability of the human body. The Paralympics show the spirit. But really, the Paralympics show so much more. 
They show tragedy, triumph and sorrow, healing, love and determination. They show passion connected. Producer and director, Ted Cooper. Host and writer, Anthony McLaughlin. Director of photography and editor, Matthew McGurk. Associate producer and integrated described video specialist, Emily Harding. Graphics, Mike Smith. Audio post, Mark Phoenix. Senior producer, Jennifer Johnson. Post-production supervisor, Janice Civitilli. Director of Production, Kara Nye. Director of Programming, AMI-TV, Brian Perdue. Vice President, Programming and Production, John Melville. President and CEO, David Arrington. Copyright 2018, Accessible Media Incorporated.